So my apologies there. We'll we'll give just a few minutes today, but but today we're gonna we're gonna dive in. We're gonna talk about locating water wells, part two, uh, site selection criteria. Last week we did a show, and if you didn't see the show last week, we talked about actually doing uh, a desktop study in the office and and uh, field work for uh, doing fracture trace and liniment uh, analysis and. That was that's part of the process here. We have some other site selection criteria that we're going to talk about today. That was kind of a big chunk of it, though, and we'll touch on that lightly here because we uh, we covered that in great detail last week, and and so so we're going to cover that today. And and uh, um, in the meantime, if you uh, um, are watching us on on YouTube. Uh, it's, I see Steve Stieg, he's here, so drop a comment in, in, in the chat so I can see you're here, and we got a few people watching now, so thank goodness on that. I, I don't know what's going on with LinkedIn, but uh, my connection just is not working here today, so so um, obviously I need to go back and, and rejigger that and <laughs> go from there, so... So my apologies, once again, technical difficulties, but that is that is live streaming. You expect technical difficulties, you just roll with the punches. That's why we stream into two different locations so that you can so that you'll have a, have an opportunity to switch back and forth. So so hopefully anybody that was trying to watch us on LinkedIn has worked their way over here now so we can we can dive in a little bit and and what we're going to talk about today is uh, well location scope of work. We're going to start off with that. And then we're going to talk about the well location ranking system, the criteria and a weighting system for actually looking at multiple locations and prioritizing those so that we can uh, determine what our best location is for for the well uh, based on our priority ranking system and and so we'll go through that today and I'll, I'll give you some examples and and uh, show you basically how how we do that and uh, uh, so so there we go so um, that that's our our crit uh, that's our uh, agenda for today and so let's let's dive into the uh, scope of work so so really what we want to do is define, before we go out, we want to define a scope of work because are we in an alluvial environment? Are we in a fractured bedrock environment? This is all going to make a difference in the scope of work. What is your goal? Um, are, are these uh, um, uh, ag wells? Are they uh, um, municipal uh, public water system wells? And and there's a lot of just different criteria that should go into, um, you know, uh, uh, assessing the, the the test well locations and and obviously what we're going to want to do and, and we always recommend that people do a test well first now now a lot of times we'll do this we'll drill the test well and then we'll we'll leave that open while we assess things and and do a final well design and and that usually won't stay open that long and then we actually will go into reaming that out and and building a uh, the 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 final well uh, do the well construction. However, uh, there are some localities or, or funding requirements that may require you to drill a test well, seal it up, and then go back later and, and drill your actual well. That, that seems um, a, a little bit like, like you're spending extra money there, uh, but a test well is definitely recommended because we can do our e-log, we can really nail down our well construction. So so really what we're looking at today is when we talk about well location is is the location of our test well. It's eventually going to become our, our uh, production well. And, and usually we're gonna drill a test well. And even if we need to abandon that test well, then we're only going to step over, uh, you know, a matter of feet and, and drill the production well. So, so all should be, be good there, um, usually probably within 50 feet or so. So the geology isn't going to change that much. All right. So first off, we need to assess our needs and current status. So what kind of existing water quality issues do we have? What do we need to take into account? Because, you know, some areas may have arsenic in some areas, uh, uh, and we need to look and see what kind of water quality issues are existing in the area, what we need to take into account. And, and sometimes these are things that we can, if, if, for instance, you have 
things like arsenic, radionuclides, uh, fluoride, things like that in showing up in the wells in the area. You can do that assessment right in, in the test boring during, during your zone testing. So, and modify the well design so that you're taking those things into account right up front and maybe reduce the need for, for treatment or eliminate the need for treatment. So, so we need to, do, uh, I mean, obviously, if you're going into an area that has arsenic, you need to know that ahead of time. And, and that's, so that's part of, you know, assessing your needs. Uh, sufficiency of the current water supply. How much water do we need? Uh, and what are our water demand requirements? Uh, your maximum daily demand, your peak hourly demand. You know, do you need one well? Do you need two wells? Uh, you know, I mean, we all want a, a well that produces uh, 2,000 gallons a minute, but but realistically, that may not be the case in some locations. So you may need three or four wells to, to meet your your production requirements. So so this is going to be important when when uh, we when we look at uh, our test well locations. Do we have enough test well locations? You want to prioritize these things, and you want to you know if you need two wells, then you probably want to have four or five locations in case one one is a bust or, or something. We we do the best we can to do these assessments, but once you start drilling, you might not get as much water as, as you thought you did and, and need to go to a backup location. So so that's a, we usually drill them in, in order of priority based on our ranking system that we'll show you a little bit later. But um, but you're going to need uh, backups to your backups, I guess, is, is really what it comes down to. So, so that's a um, – and so we'll just drill those in priority order. Uh, well, location options. I mean, clearly, uh, sometimes water districts will have land they own and they want to prioritize that. Uh, it may not always be the ideal locations, but we want to take that into account. And you'll see on our priority ranking system that we do uh, factor that in. So uh, does the water district own land? Um, do we want the, uh, the well to be located within the boundaries of the water district or can it be outside the boundaries of the water district um, do we have any restrictions and, and constraints are there um, you know construction issues are there uh, uh, issues with uh, uh, access um, um, any any uh, deed restrictions on, on the land uh, these are all things that, uh, you know, do you have power lines that, that you can't, you know, you can't get work around. So these are all uh, uh, constraints and restrictions, and, and we need to take that into account in our, in our well location uh, assessment process as well. Um, environmental screening. Now, this is something that, uh, and, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, a little bit more detail, but, but we see some people doing doing uh, well location studies where they really don't look at environmental contamination issues. And, and aside from naturally occurring contaminants like arsenic and radionuclides and things like that, we do have, you know, nitrates that, that's uh, usually a man, uh, anthropogenic or, or man-made issue. Uh, but, but you have things like solvent spills, uh, under, leaking underground tanks, these are, these are all things that need to be taken into consideration and looked at carefully because we, I have seen many a well that has been impacted by environmental contamination and, and you know, th especially things like solvents are, are especially insidious because they can, uh, they can hit multiple aquifers. They can work their way down through even through aquitards and hit multiple aquifers. And, and so you don't want that stuff ending up in your well because a lot of times the only answer is to, is to abandon your well and, and move it somewhere else. And that gets to be an expensive option. So you want to take that into account right up front. Uh, and and uh, and so we do in our, our priority system. We look at that. Uh, also, there are other areas that can be uh, they can affect uh, other environmental things besides contamination that can affect uh, the location and operation of your well. Do you have endangered species in the area? Are are you need to in California? You have the California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA. Uh, nationally, you have the uh, NEPA, which is the National Environmental Policy Act. And you need to take some of those things into consideration. And there's usually going to be some 
uh, some environmental considerations that you're going to have to have for the permitting process to uh, to take that into account. You know, how much disturbance uh, do you have endangered species? Do you have wetlands? Uh, are you on a floodplain? We we recently um, uh, put a well in it out in California, and and it took us a year and a half because it is located marginally on a floodplain. Um, we took everything into account and raised the elevation of the well and, and, uh, took a lot of, but just getting that permitted took, took a year and a half before we could even, uh, get that through the permitting agencies because it was located on a floodplain. And, you know, fortunately we had that time, everybody was not real happy about, uh, how the process dragged out, but, but, uh, there was really no other place to go where they're, they're in a valley and, and uh, and basically everything on the bottom is is a is a floodplain and and putting a well on the side of a hill just really is not an option because you're not going to get any water there. So so uh, so it was the valley bottom and there was it was at least nominally mapped as a floodplain, uh, very low base flood elevation and and so we were able to account for that in the well design, but but boy the permitting process took forever. So. So it's 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 these little factors there you really need to take into account. So it's not just the uh, environmental doesn't just uh, take into account the contamination, although that's a big big deal, and you really need to look at that and and do that as part of your upfront assessment. But you know, obviously, if you have endangered species, now you need to take that into account. I mean, are you even going to be able to locate a well in, in that area if you have endangered species issues? So. And wetlands, of course, and floodplains are they kind of go together. So, so that's that's the environmental uh, screening issues we we look at, uh, logistical issues. Now, obviously, um, you got a well, you're going to need to do something with that water. So, so uh, you know, where are you in relationship to your distribution pipelines? You need to take that into account. If you're a long ways away, um, you may have a great location for a well. But if if it if you got to uh, put as much money into building a, a pipeline extension to connect the well as you do to, to to put the well in itself, then maybe that gets a little a bit lower uh, priority ranking because I mean obviously you got to go where the water is, but but it might get a little bit lower priority ranking if if you got to build a lot of pipeline to to connect into your distribution system. Uh, do you need booster stations? Are are you going to be uh, if you, if you have say your your storage system is up higher? Are you going to need to boost that well or have a booster station uh, to get it up to where you need it to go? And so if you know, especially if you have like a gravity feed system, you're going up to a storage tank. It's a gravity feed system. How much boosting do you need? Uh, and that that can. Uh, the more boosting you need, the greater your expenses. You need to take that in, into account as as well as part of your uh, priority ranking system. Uh, treatment systems, if if the water needs to be treated, uh, if you're not just doing chlorination at, at the wellhead, if it, if it needs to be treated and run through a treatment plant, now you need to take take that into consideration as well because you're going to need to run a pipeline to the to the treatment system and treat the water before it goes into your distribution system. So you need, really need to look at uh, taking that into account as well. And where is your storage? Um, you know, even if you're doing a, a chlorination at, at the wellhead now, and you're pumping up to storage, then then where is your storage relative to, to the well and how far is that going to need to go? That ties back into the booster requirements and and, and all these things tie in together. So, so logistical issues can, can be a huge issue as well because they can certainly, most of these things are, are, are solvable. It's not like they're insurmountable, but they're going to cost you extra money. So, so if we can find a well at a location that doesn't cost us as much in terms of uh, resolving logistical issues, then then uh, that that's going to get a little bit higher priority ranking as as well. Uh, existing well data. So, one of the things we're going to want to do is we're going to we're going to want to go in when we're looking for test well locations and 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 see what what our situation is. What what are what are other wells in the area producing? How are they constructed? 
And what are the aquifer characteristics? Have they did they run into well any well drilling issues that is going to up the cost on 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 the wells, and so we can budget properly? But but well construction and yields are are really a big deal. I mean, obviously, if you're in a fractured bedrock environment and pretty much all the wells out there are yielding 20 gallons a minute, uh, you may not get a, a 100 gallon a minute well. You might but the odds are, are fairly low of that. So you'd really have to hit it spot on and, and, uh, and kind of get, get, get a little bit lucky on that. So, so you want to be realistic on, on what you can actually get. And, and if, if, uh, if the yields that, that are typical for the area based on, on the well construction, the aquifer characteristics, um, don't get you to what you need, then you may need extra wells once again. So, so that's a budget and planning issue. And so you really want to go out and, and, and as I showed you last week, uh, most states have, have a database of, of uh, well data that you can go in and you can look at. Uh, <clears throat> uh, most of these are now online. So you can look at the information right online. Uh, some places will let you download the, the well logs. California will. Uh, I don't believe, you know, for instance, in Tennessee, you can download the, the well logs online. But, but there's a lot of information. Uh, but, but it's important, you know, when you're looking at well construction to understand uh, what, what the geology is they encountered, where they screened the wells, and and what kind of yields they got based based on on those zones and that and and then you can start to tie things together if you have a number of say you're an alluvial aquifer and you've got multiple aquifer zones and they're showing up you're in a relatively flat area for instance and these aquifer zones are showing up at basically the same depth in multiple wells then you can be reasonably confident that that you drill the well, you screen those zones, and you're probably going to get similar production to, to those existing wells. So this is something we definitely want to do is, is look at existing well data when, when we're looking at locating, uh, locating uh, new wells. All right, water quality data. We, we kind of address this a little bit, but, but we have naturally occurring contaminants. We have anthropogenic contaminants. Anthropogenic means man-made. So, for instance, arsenic would be nat something that would be naturally occurring for the most part. And uh, arsenic, you know, for instance, in California is a big deal. Other parts of the country, it can be a big deal. Um, you may have specific contaminants in, in, in other areas uh, that are naturally occurring. You need to take that into account and, and, and have your eyes open when, when you go into things. Um, anthropogenic contaminants, you know, for instance, if you're in a farming area, you may have uh, nitrate issues because of the fertilizer. Um, a lot of septic systems around, you'll have nitrate issues and, and potentially uh, coliform issues as, as well. Um, other water quality issues have to do with uh, spills and, and contaminants and uh, from from uh, like leaking underground tanks. And usually, most states are going to have environmental databases that you can search. Um, if they don't, we there are a number of, of uh, companies out there that that uh, actually produce these environmental databases for for a fee. They're they're relatively inexpensive. You can look at those and and uh, and and uh, pay some money to, to get uh, a good environmental assessment. And a lot of times I'll do that anyway, even even based on, even with the um, uh, availability of online environmental databases, uh, getting, a, getting a paid database, the information is organized much more nicely and, and you usually have some kind of radius map and, and you can uh, um, see where things are relative to your potential well location. So, so that can be that can be worth worth the investment when you're looking at a water quality data and and, and those those environmental issues. So, uh, all right, reviewing the area geology and and this goes back to our our well data. 
you can get that from the well data, but we're also going to want to look at uh, geologic maps and, and cross sections where we have them so we understand the rock types we're dealing with. Are we in a fractured bedrock environment? Are we in an alluvial environment? We're going to approach these completely different. Um, we're going to do our, our fracture trace and liniment analysis uh, for for a fractured bedrock environment. That's not quite so relevant for, for an alluvial environment. So um, we're going to go in and, and uh, um, look at, understand what our geology is, what, what we're going to encounter in the wells. So our well logs are going to help us a little bit there, although sometimes uh, the geology that's reported on well logs can be a little sketchy. Usually the older the, uh, the well log, the more sketchy the, the geology is, although there's some, there's some good ones and, and you know, sometimes you need to interpret things, and, and sometimes you need to interpret things with a grain of salt, you know, where, where uh, you know, some of the descriptions get, get a little weird sometimes. But, <laughs> but you know, you just roll with the punches and take the information you got and, and interpret that. Um, <clears throat> when you get into fractured bedrock environments, faults and fault systems and jointing tend to be really, really important, and we need to pay attention to those. Um, <clears throat> Fractured bedrock environment is really going to be a situation where broken rock is going to be your aquifer. So, so usually a vertical fault system, we're doing the fracture trace uh, to, to identify these, these faults or fracture traces, and that's where, where your water is going to be. So, so we want to pay attention to that. Even jointing can be, uh, you know, a great clue. So sometimes you're going to have to go out, well, most of the time, you're going to look at this in the office, and then you're going to have to go out too and and uh, look at the geology. And if and if you're in a fractured bedrock environment, you're going to want to look at uh, rock that's exposed and try to extrapolate uh, the geology into your test well locations. And and so so this is really really important. And um, alluvial wells tend to be a little more forgiving because uh, the the aquifer zones are usually going to be sands and gravels that are going to be you know, they may be discontinuous, they may be more continuous over an area, but so you, so there's a little bit of, um, you know, they're a little more forgiving. But on a fractured bedrock environment, you, you really need to be right pretty much on spot on the fractures and, and especially uh, where fractures come together. So the more fracture traces that come together and, and uh, intersecting faults is really a, a great location for, for those fractured bedrock wells. So, so it, it, it really is important to look at, the, look at the geology. I always say geology counts in, in these things, and, and I'm going to say it again here too, so that could almost be my, my <laughs> one of my mottos, I guess. All right. Fracture trace and liniment analysis, we kind of just talked about that a little bit, uh, but uh, that mainly applies to the fractured bedrock environment. And as we discussed last week, there is a desktop study phase where you pull out your maps and your aerial photos, and you look at those and draw up your, your linears that, that could be fracture traces. And then you're going to have the ground truthing phase where you're going to go out in the field and and uh, look at those things on the ground and eliminate things, ones that aren't, aren't probably, uh, you know, really fractures. Uh, some of them might be, you know, for instance, it, you couldn't really tell on, on the map or the air photo. Some of them might be old uh, fence lines or, or tree lines or, or old roads, and, and it just is not readily apparent in, uh, from, from the aerial photo, but you go out there in the field, and, and it becomes a little more, more apparent. So, so there's definitely... Uh, a ground truthing phase. If you have, if you didn't watch the the show last week, I would, you know, you're interested in this at all. I would urge you to go back because we we talked about how to do the desktop phase using uh, free free tools, and um, and that that is uh, you know like Google Earth and 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 going and and really looking at the uh, uh, the fracture trace and liniment analysis, and that that is uh, that's a huge key for for fractured bedrock environment. So. So I'd urge you to look at that, and we got some videos uh, of what those things look like in the field too. So, so it it, it really goes hand in hand with with this week's show. All right. So what we want to do, we're going to gather all this data, and we're going to prioritize three to four test well locations. Um, 
And, you know, it depends on the number of wells you think you're going to need. Obviously, if you're going to need more than one or two wells, then, then that number is, is going to go up. So if, if you have, if you need three wells, then you're obviously going to want to prioritize, you know, six, seven, eight locations and, and then, uh, you know, come up with, with a ranking order on, on those. So, so this prioritization is all going to be based on the study we did in, in tasks one through eight that we just went over. And you're going to want to prioritize these based on the likelihood of the target criteria and take into account other criteria that, that, that is, uh, that is uh, relevant. You know, when I, when I say likelihood of your target criteria, that's usually going to be well yields uh, is, is what you're looking for. So, um, but there's a lot of other criteria we saw in, in these different tasks. And, and so, uh, so that, that all needs to be taken into account. We got a little system. We're going to show you how, how to do that here next. Um, and, but uh, lastly, you're going to take all these recommendations and you're going to put it into a report. And you're going to document your data analysis, what you did, uh, both in the office and in the field. And you're going to make your test well location recommendations. And usually what I like to do is, is I'll put them on a map. I will also have GPS coordinates and we go out and stake them in the field as well. So, so it's, they're going to be well marked so that the drillers can find them. And, uh, but, but, uh, haven't, you know, just in case your stakes disappear and it's kind of hard to figure out from the aerial photo, we like to have exact GPS coordinates so you can go out and find that location again. So, and I've had it where, we're also, you know, going out and looking at it in the field and marking it in the field is, is important. We'll adjust our GPS locations because sometimes um, these air photos get what we call georectified. So, so the uh, latitude and longitude sometimes can be off a little bit. And this is, this is one of the weaknesses of Google Earth. We have noted that, uh, that uh, their rectification of aerial photos in there can, can sometimes vary a little bit. So our locations from, uh, uh, and you go through and you, you pop through the historical aerial photos in Google Earth and you can see things, features shifting around a little bit. And that has to do with rectification for, of, of the aerial photo. So, so you got to be a little cautious with that. So we'll go out and stake them in the field and, and we will revise any GPS coordinates we came up with out there. And that should all go into your test well location recommendation. So here's the test well location. Here's why we selected this. Here's the location so that you can go out and find it and, and drill it. And then here's our recommendations for your test well design, how deep you want to go, um, the, uh, the zone testing requirements, and, and that is all going to be part of your, your test well design needs to go into your recommendations report. So, so that's uh, tasks one through 10 on, on uh, actually your scope of work. So how do we go in and, and, uh, and prioritize these things? So, so we have our well priority ranking system, and, and ours breaks criteria into four major categories. You can break these things out uh, a little different. Uh, um, you know, so your mileage may vary. This is what works for us. I'll, I'll show you an example uh, of, of someone else's, and, and we kind of rejiggered ours to kind of um, – kind of match up with theirs for the for purposes of this demonstration today so you can kind of compare apples to apples ours versus uh, somebody else's system uh, and then what you want to do is you want to come up with a weighting system so the importance of the not all the criteria are going to be weighted equally some are going to be more important than others so the ones that are more important we're going to weight a little more heavily than than the ones that uh, that, that are not quite as important so uh, but then we want to add up those those scores, and then uh, and, and prioritize the locations based on on the uh, on the weighted score. So we'll look at the raw score, but uh, we'll look at the weighted score, and you can see that that'll that'll change the priorities a little bit uh, as we as we dive into this. So. 
So what goes into our, uh, uh, what are our, our criteria we're looking at? So, so we got a hydrogeology section, obviously, so because the hydrogeology is important because we're really looking at, uh, at well yields. Everybody wants as much water as they can get, so we need to know how much we're going to get and what our best location is to, to get, get that amount of water. So we're going to do, do our FTLA assessment, uh, so our fracture trace and liniment analysis, and uh, in, that's in a fractured bedrock environment. Obviously, that's going to change for an alluvial environment. We're going to uh, basically uh, modify that a little bit. We may go back and look at, at uh, continuity of, of these aquifer zones from, from well to well in the area. And so that may be, so you're going to kind of tweak that, that hydrogeology criteria to take some of those things into account. So... What I'm going to show you today really looks at the fractured bedrock environment because it's so important to get uh, get the location right in the fractured bedrock environment. I think that's probably a pretty good example, but but you'll be able to see how you can modify this and come up with a, a scoring system based on on alluvial uh, environment also. So, and then uh, you know our our analysis of of the well logs. Do we have existing wells in the area that that have a sufficient yield. If we need a thousand gallon a minute well, and every, everybody's producing uh, uh, ten gallons a minute, now obviously that's not realistic. If if you have a bunch of twenty gallon a minute wells in the area, and you need thirty gallons a minute, that that might be doable if you if you hit the right environment. So so it's it's a. Uh, creating realistic expectations so 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 your criteria is really going to look at what are the characteristics of the wells in the area that that meet meet our our yield criteria so and that's going to enter in and also topographic criteria um it is uh you know lowlands obviously closer to wetlands uh when you get into a fractured bedrock environment uh, we haven't really talked about this in great detail in, in any of our shows, but but there is such a thing as stress relief fracturing. So and and that basically boils down to the fact that wells located in the bottom of a valley, when you're in uh, an area with significant relief, are probably going to be better due to stress relief fracturing. So it's the fracturing again, as opposed to wells that are on top of a hill. Generally, a well on top of a hill. Uh, unless there's some other compelling hydrogeological reasons to drill it there, are probably going to be um, your your worst case scenario. So so we take into account the topography because that is important and it ties it it pretty much ties back into the FTLA assessment, but also takes into account the stress relief fracturing that can produce uh, some pretty significant broken rock in, in a fractured bedrock environment and really lead to uh, some good production in those areas if, if we hit it right. So so that's area number one, is, uh, or criteria is, uh, group number one is hydrogeology. Um, and, you know, here's just some, some fun stuff here. I'm going to show you on Google Earth uh, just real quick. Um, let me just kind of zoom in here. Um, this is an area in California in a mountainous area, and this would be kind of the basis. And, and last week I showed you how to use Google Earth for, for the fracture trace and liniment assessment and, and some of the other tools that go with it. But as we zoom in here, you can see the areas and stuff, and, and we can put the topo map on here, um, and uh, we can see the, the, the topography uh, but what I really wanted to show you here is when I go out in the field, I like to photo document things. And you can basically just then in, uh, in Google Earth, you can take and, and put your photos into a KMZ file and load that directly as an overlay into Google Earth. And so this just reminds me that I can, uh, you know, what this particular location looked like when I went out there. So... We can see we got a number of different photos here. Um, you know, some of these are, are fairly nondescript, but it, but it reminds me of, of where I, what was going on, where we were at and things. Um, I believe this is actually a picture of, of one of their wells. So it just reminds me of, of what their well looks like. So, so that's just kind of a, a quick trick on, on Google Earth. I like to add these photos in for areas just, just as a reminder of, of what's, uh, what's going on here because 
um, it, you don't always uh, you don't always remember. So so the photos kind of help me remember the map locations, the GPS locations. All the stuff is tied to to the latitude and longitude, the G, GIS coordinates, and so that's. Um, uh, that uh, then is is a uh, is a good tool for for as as we look at the uh, as we look at at our locations and and as you're prioritizing these things and writing your report it certainly doesn't hurt to go back and and look at the pictures and, and refresh your memory because I tend to forget things all these locations kind of blur together after a while you go out and look at ten twenty locations and and you you have a hard time remembering so so taking pictures and photo documenting things and just dropping it in something like Google Earth works great so okay our next criteria area um, is property boundaries so this can be important um, uh, if we're working for a water system, for instance, where are we in location to, to the water system boundary? Some, some uh, water districts have covenants that say they, they can't go outside the district for their water supply. Um, you know, and how exactly that works is, is, is kind of written up. And, and so you need to determine how important that is. I, most of the time, the water districts I work with, it you know, if they, if we need to go outside, we need to go outside. They may own property outside the boundary, and so that's that's a, uh, um, so so that the uh, the rank, the priority or the the weighting criteria can can um, uh, change a little bit on this depending on on what kind of restrictions the water district has on this, and obviously property ownership. Um, if you're going to put a well somewhere. Uh, you, you, if, if it's not on property the water district owns, then you're going to have to get an easement. You're going to have to purchase the land. So we want to, uh, our criteria takes into account property ownership. And it's, if, if, if the property is already owned, and uh, then, it, then it scores it a, a little bit higher because that's just going to be one less budget item. If you got to go out and start acquiring property, that can get expensive. And, and so it kind of moves things down, down the priority rankings. Sometimes you can't avoid that. Uh, the water district may not own any, any land. And, and so, so that becomes kind of a non-entity and you can, you know, um, uh, if they don't own any land, uh, then, then you kind of change that, that, uh, uh, that weighting system on on this, so it can, it can be flexible. You, you can change the weighting, and and we'll see how that works here in just a minute. Logistics, we talked about that a little bit earlier, but but we break it down into areas. Uh, you know, obviously, you need to be able to get in a drill rig. Uh, you may have a great location, but there's power lines everywhere, and and uh, you can't get a drill rig and a support rig in there, and it just would be impossible to drill. So, so when you're going out there, um, and, and it's amazing to me, because uh, you know I, I had a, a long stint in the environmental business, and and I would sometimes pick up other people's projects, and and they'd have a work plan to go out and put in like some monitoring wells, and it was amazing to me how often people would go out and mark these locations and never look up and see a power line right over where they were planning to drill. Obviously, that doesn't work because uh, the drill rig has a mast that goes up, and and uh, you get close to a power line, you can actually get arcing, and that is not a good situation. <laughs> you can kill people. You can start fires, and so so uh, so that's one consideration on access. Sometimes there just isn't enough room. We've uh, we've seen well locations where the well got down to end of life, and um, it was in an urban area. They had uh, it had been built up around the well, and and they barely had enough room for the well and and uh, and uh, the the well surface features. There was clearly no way to get get a get a drill rig in there. Um, uh, so uh, to to drill a new well, and and usually there's going to be some kind of offset on on something like that. You're probably going to want to have a minimum of 50 feet. If you don't have it, you don't have it. So. So they had a great location for a well for a long time. The well got to end of life. They could not put a new well in that location because there was there was no room so for for the drill rig because um, the uh, the area had kind of grown up around it. So so access for a drill rig is 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 a pretty important issue and and one that that doesn't get taken into account a, a lot of times. So it's it's amazing to me 
uh, how many times it, it, it doesn't. And, and so you end up with some pretty sticky situations sometimes. So um, we talked earlier about location we re with respect to uh, distribution pipelines, storage, booster stations, treatment systems. So, so we really break it down to location re with respect to existing infrastructure. How far are you from from an existing pipeline that you can tap into to to get that water into the system, and and so that's gonna that's gonna be important because the farther away you are, the more it's gonna cost you, and the more headaches you might have. You might have uh, right away issues. So so you really need to take that into account. Uh, boosting requirements once again enter into in, enter in here. Usually, to me, that's that's a little bit lower priority factor because uh, it's uh, you either need it or you don't. And if you got an area where you got good water and you need to boost it, then then uh, that's that's just kind of it. But but if we got a, if we got a similar area that that doesn't have a boosting requirement, then obviously that'll that'll rank a little bit higher. So so logistics is, is our third area, and then uh, environmental. And like I say, I'm surprised how many times that. Uh, People do not take take uh, contamination into account when they're locating wells. Uh, so we want to look pro proximity to hazardous waste, and, and you can get that information from those databases, like I mentioned earlier, and proximity to environmentally sensitive area, wetlands, endangered species, like we discussed earlier. And so um, obviously, if, if you have any of these existing conditions that are that are, uh, you know, going to, going to impact your well location. You're going to have to do some kind of mitigation and stuff. That's going to give you a, bit, a little bit lower priority on things. Okay, so putting it together, what does this uh, really look like? So what we want to do is create a scoring sheet for our weighting factors. So we want to take all our factors that we just discussed in our four, four criteria area, and we want to create a scoring sheet that that has our our weights on there so we can come up with a a weighted score to prioritize our, our locations um you want to have a summary sheet compiling all the location scores so so every location gets a score and then it goes all goes on a sheet and you basically prioritize things based on that um and then we want to drill the test holes based on the priority order so so there you go. I mean, and this should be, if you've done your homework ahead of time and you put everything into your ranking system, then, then uh, what we have then is a, uh, um, um, a, a priority order that you just go out and, and drill your test holes basically in that order. If one of them goes bust, you move on to the next one. Hopefully they don't because uh, we've, we've done a lot of homework, but, but uh, whenever you're out drilling things, there's always that, that possibility. So, so let's look at what these things look like. Uh, here's one. Uh, let me uh, yeah, go back here where, yeah. Um, okay. So this is, um, this is, This is from uh, another site. This is this is another company did a study in an area, kind of semi near an area we had been working in, and this was their scoring sheet. So, like I said, we I got an example of what what ours looks like. I kind of reformatted it to put it in the same format, so you can kind of see apples to apples how we look at things a, a little bit differently. But you can see they have their things uh, broken down in into the same areas here. Um, uh, you have, um, you have the geo, they call it geohydrology, um, what I would call hydrogeology. They say, they call it structural features, photo liniments, um, uh, production wells greater than 20 gallons a minute. They're, they're in a bedrock environment there, uh, topography and drainage. So you can see the scoring here on, on the right. So each of, each of these uh, criteria areas has a subtotal score, but, but uh, in, in the first one here, it has a weighting factor of, of 0.17. So that is the highest uh, highest uh, weighting factor on here. And these are all going to add up to one. So, so it'll give you uh, a one. 
um, is is ranking all these weighting factors are, are basically 100. percent So, uh, so you can see you get scores over here. If you have three or more intersecting photo liniments, you get a score of 10 all the way down to zero for no photo liniments. So you get a score of zero. Uh, production wells in the area greater than 20 gallons a minute. Uh, yes, unconfirmed would mean. You know, somebody said that, that uh, there might be some out there, but you don't have the log or, or any, any data to, to show that. Uh, no. Uh, topography and drainage, um, not quite sure what they were looking at here. Um, you know, why they, two or more drainages, it seems that would overlap with the photolinears to me. So, so I do things a little differently than that. Uh, then you get into property and jurisdiction. Um, water service boundary gets a ranking of uh, weighting of 0.13. Uh, they rank it a little higher, so it's inside or outside. Land ownership, uh, in this case, they were looking at the water district versus uh, local agencies or county, privately owned, and, and uh, forest service land, Caltrans uh, easement, Caltrans is the highway department in California. Uh, construction logistics, um, you know, they, they go from 10, 5 to 0, so uh, accessible level land, no overhead, overhead obstructions, that's that looking up thing for power lines, uh, maybe a little bit of minor work required, and major site preparation required um, gets 0. Um, the infrastructure, uh, existing from, from, uh, distance from existing distribution pipeline, so you can see less than 100 feet, it gets the highest score. Uh, 100 to, to 500, 500 to 1,000, and greater than 1,000 uh, gets increasingly lower scores. Boosting requirements, yeah, they give that a, a, a 0.04. So um, uh, I might rank this, a, you know, the distance a little bit higher, uh, but ultimately you got to go where the water is, so maybe that's okay. And then um, their environmental issues here are limited to do you have previously developed or disturbed area? They do not take into account environmental contamination issues at all. So um, we do. So um, uh, let's see. Uh, and and uh, we, we kind of changed this uh, to kind of make it similar so you can see kind of apples to apples on, on theirs. I call this hydrogeology, and we're looking at our fracture trace and liniment assessment. So, um, you know, we, we have the same type of thing and, and probably the same weighting factor here. Um, you know, the production wells, and, and that's going to vary. I mean, obviously, if you're in an area where 100 gallons a minute is the norm, then you'd want to change this up too. So, um, Topography, we're looking at, at the stress release fractures here. So this is a bedrock environment, uh, for instance. And so we'd be looking at valley bottom versus hillside versus uh, uh, on top of a hill. So we'd rank things that way based on the stress relief fracturing. And, and that's very vital in, in looking for wells in a fractured bedrock environment. So property and jurisdiction. I think we got these pretty much the same as that other one, but I, I changed the the uh, weighting factor a little bit on this because um, it it it's nice to have it inside the property boundary, but unless they have an actual uh, covenant that says they can't go outside, then then you know it is what it is, and it's probably more important you know how close you are to to your existing pipeline. So um, land ownership, uh, we look water district. Uh, you know, um, you know, so so something similar here. Uh, drill rig, uh, obviously, this is this is pretty critical. Is being able to get a drill rig in, so that gets a reasonably high high ranking there. Um, distance from existing pipeline, um, I might have actually bumped that up a little bit, but pretty much the same. Boosting requirements, we got it pretty much the same. And our potential environmental issues are completely different than theirs because we're looking at proximity to hazardous waste or, or environmentally sensitive areas. So, so that's, uh, 
that's what we're looking at because I think that's far more important as to whether you had prior disturbance. I mean, that can be important, but that kind of takes into account the drill rig and support vehicle access uh, as far as I'm concerned. So, so there would have been overlap between theirs and, and we're looking at hazardous materials because that is a huge factor. And, and so I, I give that a, um, a reasonably high um, uh, uh, weighting score. So, okay. So, how does that pan out when we're looking at weighted scores here? Well, if everything gets gets a, a perfect 10 here, um, your, your raw score, which is this column here, is going to give you a 90. If we weight things out, um, then it's going to be similar. Um, your your uh, total weighted score is going to be 10. So that's going to range, uh, obviously, some of these things are you know topograph topography is not not going to be a zero or not going to be a, so you can't have a have a zero score here but but you're you're down you know around uh you know somewhere under uh, 0.5 or something like that so 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 the possible weighted score ranges from from somewhere around 0.5 to to 10 and that's we're going to use we're going to look at our raw scores but we're actually going to uh look at at uh uh, the weighted score to actually prioritize things. So, so what that looks like, and this is going back to these these other guys again, uh, because they I, I like this because they had a whole bunch of sites they they considered. So, so this is kind of nice looking at this um, uh, because they have it broken out, and and off to the left here, here's their criteria, um, and and the weighting factor. And then they have it broken out. They have all these, these are all well locations here uh, or potential well locations, target locations. Uh, and then they're repeated over here. This is the raw score for each one. And then the weighted score is over here. We would tend to go after off, off the weighted score actually. So, so they do show the ranking based on raw score. But we probably want to look at the weighting, uh, uh, the weighted score to really prioritize things. And for the most part, you can see here that that um, uh, these are uh, the first um, the first three are really the same on the raw score versus the weighted score. Uh, and then things then things change up a little bit here. So um, their number four location is actually fairly far down the list um, in, in their, their raw score. So, so you can see a difference here. And so this is a good example. And that's why I pulled this one from, from these guys because it gives you an idea of what this looks like and a, and a difference between the raw score and, and the weighted score. So, so basically we have this table set up here and, and basically the total weighted score here is how we're going to how we're going to rank these sites and that ranges from in this case 8.7 down to 2.2 and and then we got everything in between so so we would start out at at this location and drill our first test well there and kind of work our way down depending on how many how many wells we needed um and if if one of these didn't get the yields we wanted, then we'd move on to the next one. So in, in priority order. So, so in, in theory, um, we've taken all these things into account, so they should work for us. Um, the, ob obviously the, the geo hydrology or what they're calling geo -hyd hydrology here, uh, really takes into account, um, uh, the, the biggest, uh, weighting factor here is is uh, the geohydrology and and so that's going to be basically all related to, to well yields so the rest of this is going to be property and logistics and, and environmental issues so so that's that's basically what that looks like um, and and so now we have our report we go through we document all this and and um, uh, and that that's what that's basically what what goes into our report. So, uh, and then uh, that's what we we turn into the client, and then they're able to to go and and uh, prioritize things and and budget accordingly. So, if we know that uh, you know basically our priority locations require 
a little bit more in the way of logistics, uh, you know, for distribution pipeline, we're going to add, you know, have to add some on, uh, then they can go back and look at their budgets for that to get whatever easements they need before they, before they drill. But, you know, they may want to drill first before they start in investing that money, you know, to make sure they got water there. But, uh, uh, but but at least it prepares them for for that knowing knowing what's going on. So so everything has a rationale behind it in the system, and and it works quite well because you're you're kind of doing it unbiased. You're really looking at things, and it's really unbiased. It's not you know Uncle Joe's uh, a property that that we're trying to to drill on. It's 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 really you know based on on sound science and and. Uh, and interpretation of, of uh, the geology, the topography, and, and uh, what's really going on, and, and actual measurements. So, so it's 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 a good system for for prioritizing wells, especially if you're looking at a lot of locations. It can become quite confusing at times, and this really allows us to to drill down to 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 what's appropriate. So, all right, so. That's that's it for for that today. I wanted to just uh, point you to our uh, well health check process for diagnosing well problems resource guide. We have that available online, free for you. Uh, you can download it from from this location. That really gives you an idea of, of how to go through the well health check process to to diagnose if if you're having problems with the well, the yields are going down, you got some problems. That helps you kind of dial in what you need to do to to look at that. And, and get that problem fixed. So, so it's our our gift to you. Um, that's available at the at this URL. Um, if you uh, if you're into QR codes, this this will take you directly there, and and uh, you can just download it from from there. And that may be a little easier than trying to memorize and type in that uh, that long URL. So. All right. So uh, that's it for today. You can get a hold of me anytime at. Uh, uh, T Ballard at groundwaterguy.com. I'm always happy to hear from you. Send me an email, say hi, uh, tell me if you enjoyed the show. Um, here are our streaming channels, although uh, LinkedIn was, was busted today, so I apologize for that. Uh, we're always available on the YouTube channel, and our all the recordings of our shows are up there. So uh, you can get a hold of me on LinkedIn at the same address here, so, so that, that works. Um, and I'm usually always on LinkedIn, so, so you can get a hold of me there. And like I say, I'm ha always happy to answer questions. If you're interested in being a guest on the show, here's a link to, to come on. We're always interested in guests that, that are going to uh, contribute to uh, water industry knowledge. And and, uh, and the people that are, that are watching the show are water system operators, geologists, engineers, um, drillers and, and, and other people related to the water industry. So if you have a topic that's of interest, uh, we'd love to have you on the show and, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of coach you through it and, and, uh, and get you through so you can, so you can share your knowledge with the, with the community abroad. So um, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit the, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell. So, you know, when we got a new video up there. We go live every Thursday, uh, 9 a.m. Pacific time, 11 a.m. Central time. Uh, and the Groundwater Guy YouTube channel is what you're looking for. Subscribe there, and we will see you